Hi class, this is Mrs. Hoving. Um, I just wanted to review what you're doing this week in class and on your own. So today's March 26th, and um, as you can see on the page, your homework is to do that haiku quiz that we worked on uh, preparing for from last week. So this is your syllogism validity rules quiz, and um, you can see it's right there on the haiku page over here. One thing I wanted to note is this is a closed book. So um, study first, and then just go ahead and take the quiz down here. Um, this note is important, though. As you scroll up and down, if you're using the Chromebook, I've noticed that the cursors over a new answer may switch your selected answer. So make sure before you submit that the answers you want are selected. So I noticed when I was practicing it on Thomas's computer, um, it would change my answer sometimes if I scrolled over. So if you don't want to submit it as a Google Doc form here, you can just write down an email to me and just label them questions one through nine and just submit it as an email to me. But I want these by Sunday. So over the next few days, please get this done. And the other part of our homework is I'm going to give you a little slideshow lecture. And we'll go ahead and do that too um, right now. So um, just so you know, this is our slideshow. Let me see if you guys are seeing it. Okay. So um, here's kind of what we're going to do. So first to do this week is take that online validity quiz, submit me either the Google form or your own answers as an email if you're frustrated with the form. And number two, listen to this lecture on hypothetical conditional syllogisms. And then number three is do the homework questions and submit that to me by next week, by next Thursday. All right, let's get started. So the first thing that we're talking about today is called hypothetical syllogisms and these are different than what we did before the rules that we did for validity were on categorical syllogisms so I'm just going to tell you a few of the main differences and I think you'll like these more they're a little more uh, usable and fun so that we're gonna look at three different types um, and it, with these we're looking at the relationship between the propositions rather than in just specific terms like we did for categorical syllogisms so this first type that we're going to do is this week's lesson and they're called conditional syllogisms and they come in the form of if something then something else so here's my example one if you eat the last bagel then your brother will be mad so that's premise number one and they call this part um, the the major premise so we're going to change terms a little bit we're not going to worry about terms individual words but we're just going to say this whole if then statement is your major premise, your first premise. And then your second premise is what you decided to do. You decided to eat the bagel. So if you eat, if we all agree that if you eat the last bagel, then your brother will be mad and that you ate the last bagel, can we come to a valid conclusion? What do you think? Yeah, the conclusion is therefore your brother will be mad. So if we all agree that if this, this will happen, if you do the first part, then we should all agree that yes, your brother would be mad. So this is an example of a conditional if-then statement. All right, so let's look at it in a little more detail. We've got the premise one, the premise two, and the premise three. All right, so like I said, that first premise, that whole part, the if p then Q is called your major premise. And I took out the words, if you eat the last bagel, we're just going to call that the symbol P. Okay, so the part after the if, we're going to call P. And the part after the Q, the then, the your brother will be mad part, we're just going to call Q. So it's kind of simplifying it. Like remember when we did um, all S is P? Now we're saying if P, then Q. So that's all our, our major premise, is if we all agree on that premise, then we look at the second premise. We said that P happened. So remember up here, P was if you eat the last bagel. So we're saying you did eat the last bagel. P happened. And therefore, we get to the conclusion that Q will happen. Then your brother will be mad. So we're going to label these now. This part P, the part after the if, is called your antecedent. It's what's going to, it's what's, um, it's contingent contingent on. So if P happens, if you eat the last bagel, that's your antecedent, then Q will happen, the consequent will happen, your brother will be mad. Here we said that the P did happen, you were affirming the antecedent, yes, P happened, 
and we agreed that we could therefore all get to the same conclusion that Q will happen. This is called affirming the antecedent. We said P was the antecedent, so here we affirmed it. We said yes, P happened. And then we would say this is a valid mood. Mood is a way of saying yes, we can all get to a valid conclusion. This is a valid argument. It gives us a valid conclusion. Okay, so this is one example of what can happen. So let's look at the next thing. Okay, this is another possibility. That same if P then Q, if you eat the last bagel, then your brother will be mad. Let's say our, our minor premise is that you did not your, Q did not happen, so Q was your brother will be mad, but we're saying your brother is not mad. Is there any valid conclusion you can come to of what happened? So we agree that your brother's not mad. That means, therefore, you must not have eaten the last bagel, so P did not happen. And this is another valid conclusion. If we say that if P happened, then definitely Q would happen. If definitely Q did not happen, if, if not Q, then we would have to say that not P. You did not eat the last bagel. Okay, this again is another valid mood. And let me see if I can get this to type. So what you did here was you denied the, the consequent. So Q is the consequent. You denied it. I don't know if I can get that to type in. But anyway, that's what should be up in there. <laughs> you denied the consequent. Here it's written down here. Because Q, the part after the then, is the consequent. You said not Q, so you denied that that would happen. And therefore, we can get to the valid conclusion. We should all agree that P did not happen. You did not eat the last bagel. So, so far we've talked about two valid moods. The first one was affirming the antecedent. We said P happened, therefore Q is going to happen. The other one was denying the consequent. We said Q did not happen, therefore P did not happen. So those two are valid. Those ones give us valid conclusions. <coughs> okay. So, so far we've looked at the two valid moods. These are the different options for the second premise. The first one was P happened. That was affirming the antecedent. The second one was that Q did not happen and that was denying the consequent. But there's also two invalid moods, okay? So just looking at what we have here, what do you think the invalid moods could have been? So they'd have to be different than these two. So the first one is not P. So basically we're saying it's invalid if I were to say, if you eat the last bagel, this is our P part, then your brother will be mad. Here we're saying, P did not happen. So that means you did not eat the last bagel. And we're saying we can't really come to a valid conclusion about that. Your brother might be mad because you're wearing his t-shirt. Or he might be mad about something else. But just because you did not eat the last bagel, we can't tell whether your brother is mad or not. So we would say that this is an invalid mood. You cannot lead to a valid conclusion. So what would be the other one that's left? So we said P is valid, not P is invalid. Not Q is valid. So what's the last possible option is Q happened. So what would that look like? If P, you eat the last bagel, then Q. Your brother will be mad. You did not eat the last bagel was not P, but what would Q be? So if this part is the P and this part is the Q, if we said Q, your brother is mad, would be what Q would mean. Can we come to any valid conclusion about whether or not you ate the bagel? You could have ate the bite bagel to make him mad, but you could have done something else to make him mad too. Like I said, maybe you are wearing his shirt or maybe you <clears throat> finished off the milk and that's why he's mad. So anyway, we would say again that this is an not, we cannot come to a valid conclusion. So this is not a valid mood for coming to a conclusion. So these are the two valid ones. If P happens or if not Q happens, and these are the two invalid ones, not P and Q. So that's, that's the basics, and I'm just going to lay them out here a little more straightforward. Affirming the antecedent, saying that 
this is the antecedent p so if p happens then q happens we all agree that if p happens and therefore q should happen that's a valid one the other valid one was when we deny the consequent so that q is the consequent so kind of a good way to remember it is there's a q in the word consequent and that's the part q okay so if p happened then q will always happen but we said q did not happen so therefore we can say that p must not have happened and that's the other valid form and then we go look at the invalid forms denying the antecedent so if this first part's the antecedent what would our form be here see if you can fill in these question marks if we deny the antecedent we're saying if p then q we all agree on that part when we say we deny the antecedent we're saying it's not deny means not and the antecedent is p so we're saying if not p then we can't really say whether or not q happens because we don't know it doesn't it doesn't lead us to a valid conclusion so we would say the status is invalid and see if you can fill this one in affirming the consequent so if we said if p then q p is the antecedent q is the consequent so affirming the consequent means we all agree that q happened can we say for sure whether or not p happened no there might be some other way that p happened or didn't happen so we would say that this is also invalid and we can't come to a conclusion so that is the lecture on this um, I will also post some notes this is actually coming out of the logic 2 book and uh, I didn't make you guys get the logic 2 book because um, it is we're not going to go through all of it anyway so I'm just going to pull a couple chapters out and some of the information and um, and give you a homework assignment based on this